Let's take our Bibles this evening and turn to the Old Testament to Isaiah chapter 41. Isaiah chapter 41. What a joy it is to come to church and see you all here. Thank you so much for, oops, Brother Dale, we got both of these on, I think. There we go. That ought to take care of it. That sounds good. I think that took a lot of the ring out of it. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. So good to see each of you. So good to see each of you during these tumultuous days in America. Just good to see you around. Thank you so very, very much. You know, I, I find encouragement in different places. Do you look for encouragement in different places? You know, the, when David became discouraged over the situation that he was facing, the Word of God says that he encouraged himself in the Lord. He got his encouragement by finding out what his purpose was, or I should say going back to his purpose. When he did that, he accomplished more great things for the Lord. And during these days, we can't forget our purpose. We have to keep on keeping on. And keep our purpose in mind. And our purpose is to bring honor and glory to God with everything that we do. All that we say, everywhere that we go, and how that we serve and how we work. As the Ecclesiastes says, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. As Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he said, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. And uh, how important that is. So let's remain encouraged. Let's remain with our purpose and not lose our purpose. And just keep on keeping on. Brother Penn, come and read this very wonderful passage with us, please. Tonight, Isaiah chapter 41, the first 10 verses in this chapter, we'll read responsively Isaiah chapter 41. I'll read on the first verse. Please join me on the second verse and then every other verse down through verse 10. Here tonight out of Isaiah chapter 41. Keep silence before me, O islands, and let the people renew their strength. Let them come near, then let them speak. Let us come near together to judgment. Who raised up the righteous man from the east, called him to his foot, gave him the nations before him, and made him rule over kings. He gave them as the dust to a sword, and as driven stubble to his bow. He pursued them and passed safely, even by the way that he had not gone with his feet. Who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, the first, and with the last, I am he. The isles saw it and feared. The ends of the earth were afraid, drew near and came. They helped every one his neighbor, and every one said to his brother, Be of good courage. So the carpenter encouraged the goldsmith, and he that smootheth with the hammer him that smote the anvil, saying, It is ready for the soldering. And he fastened it with nails, that it should not be moved. But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. Thou whom I have taken from the ends of the earth, and called thee from the chief men thereof, and said unto thee, Thou art my servant, I have chosen thee, and not cast thee away. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. And our Father in heaven, thank you for the encouragement, Lord, that we get from your word and from, Lord, being able to meet together here in your house. I pray that you would meet with us in a, again in a special way tonight. Please, Lord, uh, speak and use our preacher fill him with your spirit as we Open your word together, and I ask you, Lord, that you just bless your word and speak to our hearts, and Lord, help us to grow together in Jesus' name, we pray, amen. Thank you, may we see it. Thank you, Brother Penn, appreciate that. What a tremendous passage this is. I already told you that the message tonight was going to be entitled, Fear Thou Not. Fear Thou Not, obviously taken from verse 10, Isaiah 41, 10, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Having said that from time to time, even the best of God's people, if I may refer to them as the cream of the crop, they need encouragement. The prophet Isaiah, in prophesying to Israel, 
was the bearer of bad news and good news. You've heard the phrase, well, I have good news and bad news. What do you want to hear first? He was the bearer of both. He really was. And often he would speak of a better day and preach of a more peaceful time. Of course, most of everything that Isaiah wrote did not only pertain to what was happening to God's people then, but what would be pertaining to God's people in the future. And God gave Isaiah Israel's future. And God also gave his people encouragement through Isaiah. And every now and then we just need an encouraging word. I think I just heard a discouraging word. Now my skies will be cloudy all day. Is that how the song goes? Something like that? No, an encouraging word is what we need. He told them there would be enemies who would rise up against them. And from this, I want you to hear the next sentence in this. Apparently, knowing God does not guarantee the absence of the enemy. Let me say it again. Knowing God, being saved, knowing Jesus as your Savior does not guarantee the absence of the enemy. If anything, it guarantees his presence in our lives. Before you got saved, you had no enemy in the devil. After you got saved, he became your enemy because now you're a threat to his work here on this earth. Somebody said one time a long time ago, you throw a rock into a hen house, the one that gets hit is going to be the one that's, that, uh, that clucks the loudest. And that's exactly what happened when you got born again because he lost one. No wonder the word of God <clears throat> calls it when. The Bible says uh, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and he that winneth souls is wise. That word win is a, another picture word that God has lovingly paced, placed in his Bible that literally means wrangling or wrestling with someone. He that winneth souls, we're constantly wrangling against the devil, wrestling against the devil for the souls he wants to keep and take to hell when they die. And when you're out witnessing, you are stepping into his territory because he is the God of this world, as the word of God says. For many years now, when I say many years, I literally mean many years. Isaiah 41.10 has been a special place of refuge for me as an individual. I think all of you have a place of refuge in the word of God. Right now, those verses or passages are going through your minds, aren't they? You know where they are. <clears throat> Some, from time to time, someone will come to me and they say, Pastor, what should I read in the Bible? They'll say, I read my Bible every day and I don't seem to get anything out of it. Or maybe the Bible has become old to them. Don't judge them right now, whatever you do. That happens to everybody, everybody in this room. There are times when the Bible is not nearly as exciting as it was. And there are days when it's more exciting than it's ever been. But I have been asked and said, they say, Pastor, what's wrong with me? And I say, well, do you read your Bible? And they say, well, yes, I do. I said, do you read your Bible every day? Well, yes, I do. Are you reading a Bible reading schedule? They say, yes, I am. I say, I will often suggest this. Okay, put away the schedule. Just put it away. Fold it up. Put it in your Bible somewhere. I said, do you have favorite places in the scriptures where you, that you know are there? And they say, well, yes. I said, rather than just reading through the Bible and not getting anything from it, rather than journaling and not remembering what you journaled, uh, rather than reading three chapters out of the Old Testament and three out of the New every day, why don't you go back to the whole passel of scriptures that have blessed your heart in times past, and why don't you just dwell there for a while? I said, and let God speak to you all over again. I've used the illustration many times. It's like cornflakes. You taste them again for the very first time. What do I mean by that? Sometimes we let the scriptures that we know by heart become trite to us. Trite to the point that we skip over them or we don't think about the implications that those verses have for us. But Isaiah 41, 10 has just been a refuge for me time and again. And notice once again these comforting words. And if you know them by heart, why don't you quote them with me right now? Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. I think about how he looks at Israel, how Isaiah looks at Israel, and he calls Israel, how God looks at Israel and says, This is my servant. We read that a moment ago. Israel is my servant. My chosen people, you see. And he says that they are the chosen seed of Abraham and the very friend of God himself. 
And these are those whom he wanted to encourage. Because like I said, even the cream of the crop, God's chosen. God's chosen people of Israel. God wanted to encourage them. You know, you would think being chosen by God as a people would be encouragement enough, but it was not. Now we understand that the chosen ones are God's chosen people, the Israels, the Israelites. We understand that. The Jews, if you please. But you know, today in Christianity, those of us who are born again, though God did not choose us to be born again, he wants everybody to be saved. If I read my Bible correctly, Jesus gave his life for the sins of the whole world. And God so loved the world, and he gave his life a, pripi- a, pr- uh, a propitiation. <laughs> well, I got that messed up. A propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. And how the Son of Man came to give his life a ransom for many. In another place it says a ransom for all. We understand it is God's will for every individual on the face of this earth to get born again. But not everybody calls upon the name of the Lord in order to be saved. God did not choose us to be saved. He died for us to be saved, but he gave the final choice up to us. And even God's people today need encouragement. Now I want you to notice with me his message of hope and encouragement. If you're taking notes, three very simple points tonight, you've probably already got them figured out. First of all, he says, fear thou not. Fear thou not. And I do want you to keep your finger there, and I would like you to turn back to Deuteronomy, if you would, because Deuteronomy chapter 31 is the inspiration for this inspired verse. It goes all the way back to this. You see, the Bible is the best commentator on itself, as has been taught by many. And the truth of the matter is, the Bible tells us that every story in the Old Testament is given for our example. But the Old Testament also comments on itself. Deuteronomy chapter 31, beginning in verse 6. Listen to how similar these words are, these phrases are. Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. And Moses called unto Joshua and said unto him, In the sight of all Israel, be strong and of a good courage, for thou must go through this people unto the land which the Lord hath sworn unto their fathers to give them, and thou shalt cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, he it is that doth go before thee, He will be with thee, he will not fail thee, neither forsake thee, fear not, neither be dismayed, fear thou not, for I am with thee, be not dismayed, for I am thy God, I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. When I was little, and there were times when I was very afraid, probably each adult in this room, and each adult listening to my voice tonight over the internet, have been times when you were younger where you were afraid. And there are some, even as adults, who are afraid as well. And I just want to say that when I was a young boy, I had times when I had fear in my heart. But I had a dad uh, who would be near and dear when I had fear in my heart, and I thanked the Lord for my dad. Often he, uh, when I was afraid, my parents would stay up with me and do what they could to help me not be afraid. Uh, Their gentle touch, uh, their gentle voice, Uh, There are threats if I didn't go to sleep right away. (laughs) You know what I'm talking about, don't you? And uh, they would do their best to comfort me in times of great fear. And uh, listen, if we were walking through a dark house or through the dark woods, I remember how I would cling close to my dad. And when we would go down to Tennessee and on vacation, and I remember how dark it was down there because there were no street lights where my grandparents lived. Uh, They lived down in the holler, uh, down that way, and uh, I remember we'd go up on the hill uh, sometimes at night and go out there at night, and my my dad would put a carbide uh, lamp on his his head, and we'd walk out into the woods. I didn't walk off in those woods by myself, I'll guarantee you that, not when I was a little boy. I hung close to my daddy because my daddy could hold my hand or he could pat me on the head or he could, just knowing that he was there encouraged me. And when I was a kid on vacation in Tennessee one time, I remember how the skies turned black. Now, some of you all, when a bad storm comes up, you say the skies turn black. Actually, they don't. They turn a dark gray. And uh, you'll say, oh, the skies were black. No, the skies weren't black. They were just dark. In Tennessee that time, I remember how they turned gray and then how they turned black 
and then how they turned purple and black. And we knew that a bad storm was coming. And I remember we stopped at a store. We picked up uh, those little six and a half ounce bottles, seven ounce bottles of pop. And I remember we picked up a little pallet of those, a little wooden pallet of those at a local store. And uh, I remember that we also picked up some cookies for that night and came uh, back to Paul Paul Parton's house. And, uh, and boy, wouldn't you know it, the electricity went out. Wind picked up, started blowing really, really hard. It was that night that I wasn't sure if we were going to live or not because a tornado went right smack dab over the top of my papa's house. And when I say over the top, I mean over the very tip top of that house. I, uh, if, if you were to see where my papa Parton lived, there was a hill here, and then down there was the chicken coop. And on down further, a little bit further, and then the house was here. And then on the other side of the road, the hill went up. So we were down in, in an impression there. And his house, basically, it was like a tooth. It was as brittle as a toothpick. Uh, they had so many, uh, so many layers of, of wallpaper on the wall. When you pushed them, they would crack. You, you could actually push them in. And uh, <clears throat> the house was just as brittle as it could be. And old, oh my goodness, that house was old. My dad grew up in that house. And out in front of that house was about a 40 or 50 year old pine tree. And I remember that night we were watching and the wind blew and the, all the electricity went out. And when you looked outside, when the lightning would flash, you could see the trees bending in the wind. And then it, when they say a tornado sounds like a, a freight train going through, that is really an accurate description. It sounds like a freight train driving right by your house. And I remember we looked up and we, just, we could see in the lightning, the clouds were just boiling. It was an incredible night. I was actually fearful that night. wasn't sure what was going to happen. And then we heard a giant crack the next morning when we looked out. That tree was snapped like a toothpick laying in the front yard and across the road so that we couldn't get out where my papa lived. But I was that night pretty close to my dad. I figured if he went, I would go. And if he didn't, I wouldn't. And you know, I look back on that, that was a very scary time in my life. And when Jesus, I think, stood on the water and the disciples were frightened, he looked at them and he said, fear not. Fear not. Now, why would he say that? Well, here's a fellow they thought was a ghost walking on water out in a storm. And the first thing he said to them, it wasn't hello. It wasn't howdy, howdy. It wasn't guess who I am. And though it was fear not, don't be afraid. He did the same thing when he appeared to the disciples in the upper room after he had been uh, resurrected from the dead. And he just showed up. And they were hiding. Uh, and they were afraid for their lives. What was the first thing that Jesus said to them when he appeared and came through the wall? He said, fear not. Why? Because they had reason to be afraid. I think about that. And as you face the storms of life and the uncertainty of the future... You got to remember what God says in Isaiah 41 in verse 10. He says, fear thou not. Fear thou not. But then he gives us a reason for it. Secondly, notice this. He said, for I am with thee. For I am with thee. What a wonderful, blessed promise this is. God promises to be with those who belong to him. And he says, here, fear thou not, for I am with thee. He did not say someone else was there. He said, I am with thee. Don't be afraid. I am with thee. The one who calms the sea, the one who stills the storm, uh, the one who created the universe, the one who spoke and all that we see and all that we know came into existence. He said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. We have a, a music CD that we play every now and then before the services here on Sunday morning and sometimes on Sunday night. The title track is don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. So really a delightful song. I think about how the Apostle Paul wrote in Hebrews 13 and verse 5. He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. During vacation Bible time when the children would memorize their verses, the first verses they had to memorize before they memorized anything, and the first verses that they had to say before they could say anything else was the little plan of salvation that we had in the little pamphlet with all their verses. And for assurance of salvation, we use these little words, I will never leave thee. 
We showed them, I will never leave thee. In other words, once you're saved, you're saved forever. He's not going to let you go. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And my Father, which gave them me, is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The Bible says that we're saved, we're not going to be, uh, we're not going to pass into condemnation, but we are passed from death unto life. You see, I will never leave thee. In our darkest hours, God is with us. I don't know about y'all, but that, that makes me feel pretty good knowing that I'm not alone in this old world. Isaiah, again, used God, uh, was, was used of God to give God's promise to his people. I want you to take your Bible very quickly. You're in Isaiah 41. Go to Isaiah 43, if you would please, in verse 2. I like this. I remember when Lester Roloff would sing this in a song that he had. And I always loved hearing it. And I can hear his voice right now singing it. But it says here in Isaiah 43 in verse 2, When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flames kindle upon thee. You see, ladies and gentlemen, during this entire thing that we're going through in our country right now, and the thing that we're faced with many churches in America right now, God is with us. Surely you don't think God's not aware of what's going on? Surely you don't think that God has forgotten about us. Surely you don't think that God has forsaken us and walked away. He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. When we pass through these deep waters, when we pass through these fires, when we pass through these rivers and these oceans and these depths that we go through, he says, I am there with you. Fear thou not for what? I am with thee. I am with thee. And I think about tonight when I walk out and I preach, I think about how he's with me. And I think about when I attend services like what you all are tonight, he is with me. And when I'm out on the road driving or going someplace, he is with me. <clears throat> no matter where I go, he is with me. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, you see, uh, in Psalm 23. Oh, how God is so good to every one of us. And I know sometimes God's people, like I said, even the cream of the crop, even the very best of God's people, even the most dedicated of Christians from time to time feel like they're all alone. I've been in the ministry long enough to have heard it from many, all alone, all alone. But I just want to say tonight, you're not. Fear thou not, for I am with thee, God says. But thirdly, I want you to see this. He says, be not dismayed, be not dismayed. And I love this because again, you know, I refer to this often and I've had people ask me, say, pastor, what do you mean when you say a picture word or a picture phrase? We're going to see one right now. It's interesting to note that the little word dismayed that is found here in Isaiah 41, 10, fear thou not for I am with thee, be not dismayed. He said, what does it mean? It literally means to look around. Don't be looking around. And that's not what we do often. If God doesn't come through, we're going to look around. Like the one pastor said to me, if God won't do it, I will. Scared me to death and still scares me to death when I think about that. If God ain't going to do it, I'm not going to do it for him. I'll guarantee you that. And he says to look around. Anytime God's people take their eyes off him and look around, they become dismayed. And they do. And I think that that's something that Christians need to keep in mind, keep their eyes on Jesus, looking unto him, the author and the finisher of our faith. That one looking unto Jesus and keeping our eyes on that wonderful prize. It is said that if you're going to plow a straight row, you must not look around while you're plowing. You know that's true. Uh, that's true. And if you've ever plowed or ever done anything uh, to where you've had to be straight on a, uh, on a row of something, if you take your eyes off of the end of the row, you end up going crooked. You end up going crooked. How many know what I'm talking about? You do, don't you? It's such a vivid picture in the word of God where the Bible says in Luke 9, 62, and Jesus said unto him, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Looking back, looking around. Checking out and looking around. You're going you're gonna to plow a crooked row every time. 
if you're not got your eyes on the end of that roll. Isn't it amazing how the Lord tells us where to put our eyes and how to keep our eyes focused on him? You see, uh, looking back and looking around while doing the work of God will always make you plow a crooked road. And so many Christians today get so sidetracked because they're always looking around. It's no wonder that the patriarch of many of our churches, Dr. Lee Robertson, always said just right down the middle, not to the right hand, not to the left, always right down the middle, just keeping your eyes on it. No wonder he said that, and he knew what he was talking about. But there are folks today that are just looking to the left and looking to the right, and they're, they're getting discouraged because they don't have their eyes out there in the middle of that row taking care of things as they ought to. Be not dismayed. Don't be looking around. And he did not want them looking to other gods. He proclaimed, I am thy God. Don't be looking around for another god. Look to me. I am thy God, he said. Don't let money be your God. Don't let your friends be your God. Don't let your family be your God. Don't let your job be your God. He said, you look to me. I am thy God, you see. Oh, how important it is that we realize that he is our God. He is our God. And so often, even God's people get discouraged over what's going on right now rather than spending some time praying. And you know, I'm a pretty much of a private person when it comes to praying and things like that. On occasion, I'll tell you something that I've been praying about after God answers it. But I don't wear that prayer request on my sleeve so that everybody here can do what they can do to try to answer my prayer. I kind of like it when God just comes through. And he comes through quietly, and he comes through privately, and he comes through powerfully. And I love it when he does that. But I would hate to think that God answered my prayer because I splashed it all over the entire United States of America, you see. I want to know when I go into my prayer closet that I shut the door and God hears me in secret and he, he answers me openly. Oh, what a great blessing that is, you see. And how I could share with you yet even tonight the great things that God has done, but God is so good. And there's no need to look anywhere else. There's simply no need to look around. It's like the blind fellow that walked into a store that had a seeing eye dog and he walked back into one of the aisles and picked his dog up and started spinning him around just like that. And the clerk said, what are you doing? He said, I'm just looking around. Just looking around. But you remember the old joke, the one that I tell that you go hey, about? The fellow that fell off of a cliff, grabbed onto a limb about halfway down, started screaming, help, 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 somebody help me. He kept calling out. And finally, a booming voice came out of the clouds and said, I'll help you. He said, God, help me, please. You've got to get me off of this limb. He said, do you believe in me? I, yes, I believe in you. Do you believe I'm all powerful? Yes, I believe you're all powerful. Do you believe I can do anything? Yes, I believe you can do anything. Do you trust me? Yes, I trust you. Okay, let go of the limb. Silence. Is anybody else out there? And you know, so many believers live exactly that way. We chuckle, we laugh, we snicker at a silly joke like that. But it's absolutely how many believers live. Because if God doesn't come through the moment we snap our fingers, then we look to other places. He said, fear thou not. Don't be looking around. I'm your God. Tremendous advice. And then fourthly and lastly, when the enemy would come, God promised these things. One, I will strengthen thee. Number two, I will help thee. And number three, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Right now, many of God's people are faced with an enemy that they've never had to face before. Not in our generation. Every generation, God's people have faced enemies. The God of this world is busy. He's busily at it. <clears throat> and God's people are faced with enemies all the time. But in our generation right now, here in the U.S., where we are right now, we're facing enemies that we've never had to face before. We're facing hard times we've never had to face before. We're going through a situation we've never had to go through before. And I just want to remind you, he said, I will strengthen thee. And then he said, I will help thee. The deaf have a beautiful sign for the word help. They hold one hand out and one hand under and lift. Just like that. 
And when they sing, burdens are lifted at Calvary, it talks about how a hand underneath us. Now that reminds me again of the Old Testament where it says, underneath are the everlasting arms, you see. I will strengthen thee. I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Oh, the blessed promise of God meant for his people who face enemies daily. He gave a threefold promise here, which should be all that we need, even today and maybe especially today. When God's people are attacked, they often have no strength. But yet God says, I will be your source of strength. Have you ever become depleted in your strength? Maybe waiting on God, maybe being faced with a trial, and, you, and, and maybe you just you feel as though you've lost all your strength. I've been there, and I know I'm not the only one. God says, I'll be there to give you strength. Boy, what a great promise that is. And when God's people are attacked, they often do not know which way to turn. And God says that he would be their source of help. I am thy God. Don't look around. And when God's people are attacked, they often fall and do not know how to rise from the rubble. But yet God said that he would hold them up with the right hand of his righteousness. Can you picture that? We sing with the children that I am weak, but he is strong. I wonder where all those little children's songs come from, from the word of God. I am weak, and the weak symbol sign is knees buckling and falling down. But he is what? Strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. And he says, I am thy God, and I will strengthen thee, and I will help thee, and I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. All the promises that God has given his people in his word are true. And the apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthian believers, he said, all the promises of God in him are yea. And in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. God has never made a promise that he did not keep. He's never said a word that was not true. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And for years, I wondered why he had to be faithful and just. And then I learned it one day. He's faithful to his word because he promised. And he's just to his son because that's why Jesus gave his life on Calvary. The promise that's found in Isaiah 41.10 is just as valid today it was to the people of, as it was to the people of God in Isaiah's day. And as you face those obstacles and those enemies and those hard days, uh, day after day, every day that you live, take to heart what God has said in Isaiah 41.10. He says, don't be afraid because I'm with you. He said, don't look around because I'm your God. He said, I will strengthen you when you're weak. I will help you uh, when you don't know where to turn. And I will uphold you when you're about to fall. The Bible says that a just man does fall seven times. But it says, yea, he riseth up again. Why does he rise again? Because of the upholding hand of God Almighty. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, during these uncertain days, these uncertain times. Oh, during these days of doubt, these days of, uh, of all kinds of things being thrown at the people of God. Don't run away from nor forsake Isaiah 41.10. Remember, it's still there, and it wasn't just for them. It's for us because it may have been said to them about God at that time, but my Bible tells me that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he never changes. He's always the same. Aren't you glad you've got an unchanging, immutable God? Heavenly Father, thank you now <clears throat> for the encouragement.